to you by Horizons Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation ETF, which trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol HRAA and is sub-advised by Resolve Asset Management. HRAA is an alternative fund whose investment objective is to seek long-term capital appreciation by investing directly or indirectly in major global asset classes, including, but not limited to, equity indices, fixed income indices, interest rates, commodities, and currencies. HRAA gains exposure to these asset classes by investing in derivative instruments that may include future contracts and forward agreements and securities. HRAA will take long or short positions, using up to a maximum of three times leverage in asset classes such as equity indices and fixed income asset classes, commodities, currencies, volatility indices, and other alternative asset classes. To learn more about this, please visit www.horizonsetfs.com slash HRAA to read about the ETF's investment objectives and important disclaimers about the risks associated with an investment in the ETF. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're well, live. Well, here we are. Yeah. Another Friday. Cheers, yeah. everyone. Cheers. We've made it through another up. week. We did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just you're just gonna do the water, huh, Nance? Yeah. Water, eh? And happy hour. You guys didn't prepare me for that. <laughs> Adam doesn't even have Adam doesn't even have any liquids to drink. What's, what's going on, buddy? Yeah. Oh I'm my just goodness. Unprepared. All right. Um, well, before we before we start, let's warn everybody that uh, if they want professional investment advice to get it from somewhere else other than here, we're going to have a wide ranging conversation and go in lots of different directions. So we want the uh, uh, the latitude to do so. And uh, so with that, I will uh, start the show. Go ahead. Adam. Yeah, no, I just wanted to welcome Nancy for everyone who um, is watching. This is none other than Nancy David, maybe Nancy, give your bio so that um, everyone knows where you're coming from and uh, what you're doing these days. Yeah, your, your career arc would be great. I think yeah. that, that's informative from from uh, from that perspective for all of the listeners and watchers. Sure. Um, so I'm uh, really happy to be here with you guys this afternoon. Uh, it's a nice way to end the week. Um, I'm Nancy Davis. I'm the founder of Quadratic Capital. I founded the firm in 2013. Um, so it's been a, a lot of fun to run my own business and, um, and innovate in the, in the ETF space. Um, I'm the portfolio manager for the Eyeball ETF, and uh, I started my career um, before starting Quadratic. I spent most of my time at Goldman Sachs. Um, I was at the firm for about a decade, and uh, I rose to become the head of credit derivatives and OTC trading for the internal prop team, so no capital, no outside money. It was just Goldman's capital. So, Very neat. And, and then how, how do you think that your career trajectory prepared you for the management of this type of strategy? So, so maybe what does the strategy do and, and what makes you uniquely qualified or experienced to, um, to do it justice? So the strategy is um, long convexity. It's, a, it's an inflation protected bond fund, but then we augment the measure of inflation away from just the CPI index. Um, the big problem that we see with just using you know, many investors talk about inflation and inflation expectations, but they're talking about the difference between nominal bonds and inflation protected bonds. And it's sort of like saying, you know, I'm going to have equity exposure, but I'm only going to buy uh, the Dow Jones or the TSX. It's just a index. And so my expertise is really on the um, options side. And what we do is we add options that are on the rates market because the rates market is a broader measure of inflation and inflation expectations. And we use long options, which are long fixed income volatility, because it's a very nice uh, uncorrelated thing to own inside a portfolio. Um, And uh, in my experience um, from Goldman was running cross asset class vol strategies. And we think, you know, most most regular investors don't realize they're short ball with their mortgage exposure. Um, mortgages in the United States, uh, at least I'm not sure about Canada, but investors, uh, homeowners can prepay whenever they want. So a mortgage owner is actually short an option. Um, so we saw that there was a problem with uh, fixed income portfolios and the search for yield and uh, taking too much credit spread risk. And so the nice thing about 
running a firm and running a business is you can innovate. And so we actually created uh, the iVol ETF and listed it in May last year, 2000, I'm sorry, two years ago now, 2019. Yeah, it's amazing that we're in 2020 yeah. already. So when you, 2021, Jesus. Um, so when you, when you say the rates markets, you mean taking positions in like Fed funds, Euro dollar, um, uh, like different different bills markets or like right up to kind of two years or what, what do you mean by that? It, it's a good question because there are like a million different interest rates, right? There's policy rates, there's SOFR, LIBOR, uh, treasury curves, swap curves. Um, so specifically, we have exposure to real interest rates because we use treasuries with inflation protection, the TIPS market. So those are just U.S. treasuries plus inflation that resets with CPI. And then we augment that with interest rate options. And what we use are OTC interest rates. So our fund is really an access vehicle because there is no listed market. So most people can't access, you know, you could trade a listed product or you could trade treasury options, but we use um, the OTC swaps market, um, which is something that most investors can't access on their own. Gotcha. So maybe paint a picture for what your portfolio might look like. And I don't know how granular you're, you'd love to go, but I mean, just, just to give investors sort of a general sense of what, what the portfolio mm -hmm. might hold from day to day. So 85% um, of the fund is U.S. Treasuries. Uh, we use the tips with inflation protection, and then we use cash as a way of reducing the duration of that passive index. Um, and then we own fully funded options. So it's a pretty simple strategy in the sense that there are only, you know, not many funds have only three things in it, with one of them being cash. But the options are are pretty unique and something that you know, even though a lot of investors might have experience with all sorts of you know credit products and other strategies, a lot of people are not as familiar with with options, especially OTC interest rate options. And so it's a nice you know I think of it as almost like a mirror image of a mortgage. You know, if you think about a mortgage, it's a in the U.S. at least it's an agency obligation coupled with that short option. Ival is a treasury obligation coupled with a long option. And we actively manage the portfolios. So when managers buy the ETF, they're hiring us and the quadratic team for our expertise with managing OTC interest rate options. Gotcha. So that the tips portion, is that a, is that a tips ladder or are you targeting a certain duration or how does that look? So we, we actually keep it really simple. Um, we are a total return fund. So we use um, a passive tips index. We use a $14.5 billion uh, treasury fund. Um, there's actually about $40 billion of AUM in that one index because there's another ETF that uses it. So it's just a passive index fund. And then we use cash as a way of reducing that passive index duration. But it gives our ETF tons of liquidity and also it allows us to really embrace the technology. And that's what I see ETFs are as uh, the technology for in-kind trading. So we try to be very tax efficient with our fund. And so we do most of our bond trading, what's called in-kind. So, um, you know, at least for 2020, the fund had zero, zero, zero capital gains. Yay. <laughs> Which is pretty awesome. You know, being we're an inflation fund, we want to be, we want to be focused on total return. That's great. I really like the idea of covering a broader spectrum of, of inflation risks. So mm -hmm. I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you think about that, because we talk a lot about how the CPI and the PCE deflator and other inflation baskets don't are not necessarily representative of a typical investor's consumption basket. Like, you know, if you're hedged against CPI with tips or you've got a pension that 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 is indexed to some inflation metric, there's no guarantee that that inflation indexing or hedge is actually going to hedge against the type of inflation that you might experience, right? Um, depending on your income bracket, your lifestyle preferences, et cetera, you may be exposed to a, a broader spectrum or maybe a, even a narrower um, mm -hmm. set of inflation type exposures. Um, so how do you think about that and, and how do you express that thinking in this in this product? Yeah, so we, we do agree that, you know, the 
there are a couple problems with tips by themselves. Like one is the index measure is all linked to that CPI basket, right? Which may or may not be the right measure. And number two, um, they're long duration. So if we actually had inflation, um, the bonds will lose money in a higher yield environment. So those were kind of the two problems we were trying to solve was A, you know, giving another measure of inflation and inflation expectations, B, solving for what do you do with the duration in a TIPS portfolio. And I think the third is giving access to the fixed income vol markets because most, most fixed income investors are short volatility in their fixed income, but from the mortgages. So those were the kind of giving a long vol product in fixed income space, giving exposure to inflation expectations not measured by CPI, and then also trying to create a better product that could actually you know, potentially work. If you had inflation, you'd likely have higher interest rates. So you don't want to be giving up all your returns if you're you know, preparing for the, uh, I think of it as almost like, if you own or rent a home uh, or apartment and you have homeowners insurance or renters insurance and your your house doesn't burn down you're not like oh man that was you know that was a total waste of money and i feel like inflation protection is one of those things for investors portfolios because you know nobody wants to outlive their wealth and cpi uh there are a lot of downsides with it uh number one it's uh one <laughs> one U.S. government entity, and that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics who calculates this index. And currently today, you can go on to the, you know, if you just Google BLS and CPI, you can see what's in the CPI, but about about a third of it is what they define as shelter, right? And if you peel back the onion, you're like, what the heck is shelter? It's actually mostly urban rent. So, you know, I don't think at least most of our clients are like, well, that's not necessarily the thing that they are super worried about, um, especially with the pandemic and generally rent prices, like at least in, you know, we're outside of uh, New York City um, and, you know, rent prices are down to levels they were 10 years ago. So. Gotcha. So I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm totally dominating this because I'm actually super curious. I've got like tons of questions. Keep, keep I'm going. Sorry. Just keep going. I'm, we'll fine, that's you fine. Roll. We, we <laughs> earlier were another show, so we're you you weren't oh, there. Yeah, Go right. ahead. You already you, you, you guys have been having too time many time uh, sips right. of drinks tonight, right? <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> He's very right. chill. Exactly. <laughs> Everyone so, who knows me knows I'm very quiet and reserved. So that's that's right. Those are the adjectives I've always used to describe you. Yes. <laughs> Anyone who says that is lying. <laughs> uh, precisely. Usually, usually your your intuition is dead on there for sure. Um, so I guess your the, the inflation hedge. Um, for, for Ival, if I have the mechanics right, are predicated on that inflation manifesting in, um, either a parallel move higher across the yield curve or a, an increase in the slope of, of the yield curve. Um, yeah. which of those are, is the strategy most sensitive to or, or or let's call it convex to um mm -hmm. and then as a second part of the question and we'll just start with the first one but i just just so you know where i'm going um there's been a lot of talk of sort of yield curve control and and what they might call financial repression right where inflation ticks up but the fed keep puts a cap on rates um mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so, so let's, but so let's start with sort of what are the sensitivities of, of this convexity in terms of slope versus just a parallel move. And, and then we could touch on some of the implications there. Yeah. So maybe first for your listeners, let's just, let's just take a step back. What the heck is the yield curve? Let's just define that to say, you know, what is it? It's definitely, um, so there's, there's policy rates, which is what any central bank sets, you know, so in the United States, the Fed sets the policy rates. And then there's rate expectations, meaning when the rates market thinks the Fed would be hiking, for instance, in the U.S., they're not really pricing in any hikes, you know, anytime soon. And then the yield curve is just largely a measure of inflation expectations in the future because that's a risk premium. So like today, um, you know, if you go out to a bank and you open up a CD, you know, policy rates are close to zero. Maybe you get five basis points. If you say, how about I lock up my money for two years, you would get 
10 basis points. And then if you say, hey, how about, how about a decade? How about I lock up my money for 10 years? You would get paid a little over 1% to lock up your capital for 10 years. And that's because the yield curve is unnaturally low. And that's because a lot of people have been thinking, oh, they're going to do yield curve control and things are not going to be normalized. And so that's really the difference between short dated and long dated rates. And it's currently a little over 1%, which is a very abnormal situation. Um, you know, I think the best example I like to put, you know, talk about is a 2013 policy rates in the US were still near that zero bound. But it was just normal that if you went to a bank and you locked up your money for 10 years, right, 10 year lockup, that you would get paid 2% plus a little bit. There was no fear of inflation, no average inflation targeting, no blue wave in the United States, no fiscal spending, no yelling in the treasury. That was just normal. Um, today is not normal. And that's a, the kind of exciting thing for us with the eyeball ETF is we don't really need there to be some tail event or inflation. We just need a normalization in the rates market which you've really already seen in the credit and equity markets, right? They've already priced in a recovery, but still a lot of investors and in rates don't believe it, right? They're all hanging out. And you can see that with the level of, you know, 10 year interest rates, whether it's 10 year treasuries or 10 year swaps, you know, why in the world would you get paid, you know, 1%, you know, when CPI is already higher than that, you're basically locking in a negative yield. So I think, this, the yield curve is really largely that risk premia is largely a result of investors' expectations for inflation in the future. So hopefully, did I? No, that was a really good background. Yeah, from, for sure. And and so what I think I'm reading between the lines here then that you, the primary exposure here or sensitivity or, or convexity of the options um, portfolio is to a steepening. Of, of the curve and you're, you're less concerned with sort of a generalized rise in, in in rates, right? The steepness of the curve reflects inflation expectations that that's specifically what you are targeting a hedge toward. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people use those words, but I think what it what it what it plays out to be is we want the widening between short and long dated rates. That's another way. I think it's easier and more intuitive for people to think about because most, especially most fixed income investors, are used to looking at credit, right? And with you know anything that has a credit spread, whether it's you know levered loans, floating rate notes, you know high yield bonds, investment grade, you want the credit spread to tighten or interest rates to go lower to make money. With us, we're long bonds, so lower yields is, you know, especially lower real yields is good for our, our treasuries that we own. We have a lot of bonds, so we don't dislike low yields. Right. Um, and then the options, they're they're completely agnostic to the level of rates. So absolutely, right. like whether whether rates were positive ten percent or negative ten percent, they don't care. They just want the spread between short and long dated rates to widen. So I think comparing it to credit is like a little bit more intuitive for people to understand because a lot of people like when you say steepening of the yield curve and they're like, what, the fuck? what is that? You know, they have no idea what you're talking about. And so I think it's more intuitive to talk about widening. And and the neat thing is, is like that widening can happen in a lot of different environments. You could have, say we have a huge risk off environment, say, you know, the the vaccine doesn't work, you know, it's huge risk off. And the rates market starts to price in negative rates from the Fed that can, you know, widen the spread. So it can be lower front dated yields or it could be like a super risk on day like November 9th, the day the vaccine was announced. The market's ripped, right? Equities rallied, credit spreads tightened and anything that had duration, whether it was short duration, long duration, it didn't matter. Anything that is you know, even short duration strategies are still long duration, right? They're just less long. So all those strategies lost money, you know, tips were down about 30 basis points. I've always up 66 basis points that day, even though tips were down 30 and that's 85% of what we own. And so the cool thing is the options don't really care about the level of interest rates. We just want it to widen. Is that, yeah, is that clear? It, yeah, and, and certainly the prior to COVID hitting the markets, we saw that it was fairly cheap in terms of, like I was looking at the move index prior to the event. 
And of course, yeah. then it widened. But it looks to me now that it, we are at like historic low fall for for uh, interest rates again, which is absolutely bonkers. Right? So it's, it's an opportunity to back up the truck and get as much cheap convexity in that trade as you can. Yeah, it's. I, I call myself a Vega monster because I just want to gobble it all up. We're just we love all the vol and uh, and the move index actually hit its um, all time history of financial market lows on my birthday. And I was like, this is a gift from God, you know. It's, <laughs> I just buy more. <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah, and, and we don't have the move index. The move index. Interesting thing about that index world is it's all from the equity side of the business. And there's not a lot of pipes into the rates market. It's the same reason, like, why can't you buy an ETF in a 401k account? It's kind of stupid. It's just old technology. That's why they all use mutual funds, which I'm sure drives you all crazy, right? Um, so the index world is more legacy equity. So they need something listed in order to get prices. So the move index is not, you know, it's tr listed treasury options so it's not the same thing as what we have but it's the only index out there the cool thing about what we own is our volatility is actually lower than what that index is so it's even cheaper to buy this inflation protection than what the move index is pricing in so i think it's useful to um and, and you can obviously feel free to correct me but but i think what you were saying was really interesting right it doesn't you don't need rates to go up to mm. um to, to earn uh, to, to, to generate PL on your on your options portfolio, e rates short rates can go down, mm -hmm. and long rates can stay where they are. Uh, short rates can go up, but long rates can go up more. You know, uh, any there's a variety of combinations yeah. that would be beneficial to your to, to the positioning of, of the portfolio, and and just to, to sort of put the icing on the cake, in the event that you've got an increase in um, in, in vol, right? So vol sort of expressing the uncertainty of, um, of agents in the rate market. Uh, when vol goes up, you also benefit, right? So, uh, yeah. you, you've got these, these three levers and that extra, that extra, uh, Delta on, on the, the vol is, is, is mm -hmm. also nice. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. we've got a couple of questions from, from the audience. So awesome. Anthony, uh, Antonia, uh, asked Antonio. is IVOL minus SCHP equal to a rate the the cost of a rate swap? No. So <laughs> the answer the, the, uh, expanding on the answer to that might be illustrative. Okay, sorry. <laughs> they just no, no. Thank you for your question. No, yeah, thank yeah. you. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Antonio. I should be more um, polite. So no, it's um we we obviously uh, SCHP is a passive bond index that we do. Uh, to be very, um, to use that in-kind technology when we're trading our bonds so we don't generate capital gains tax and try to be tax efficient. And then the options component is inside that so you can compare, you know, here I'll, can I share my screen with you? Would that be you it? You can, okay. yeah, please do. I'm uh, trying to show, because everybody wants to know, like, what's the breakdown? And we we show that, hold on one sec. I'm a uh, share screen. And I went to monitor. I have a couple of monitors. I want this monitor. And okay, can you see my screen? Well, yes, we can. Okay, so to see eyeball, yeah. better than just to know, I'll put numbers behind it. Here is the performance of um, the eyeball product versus uh, the tips. And so you can see, you know, in numbers that no, it's not, it's not swaps i'm like super anti swaps i don't like linear instruments generally like futures forward swaps they're all derivatives and um this is a pretty pretty interesting i have a different way of looking at the world but derivatives are like you know it's like fruit right it's just lots of different types of fruit we use options only and we want the asymmetry because inflation can go negative, right? We, we could clearly have a deflationary. There is no zero bound. And so if you had a swap, you would make a dollar, lose a dollar. I think that's really yuck, you know, especially with vol being so cheap. Why would you want to make one, lose one? Um, so we don't use swaps. We don't like swaps. A lot of people use um, inflation swaps. Those are also yuck, in my opinion, because they're linear. And they're still using that CPI. Let me just she share again. I'll just share my screen on my uh, Bloomberg monitor, one sec. 
So can you guys see this? I'm going to make it bigger. Yep. Yep. Um, so here you can see the five-year break-even, which is the difference between nominal treasuries and inflation-protected treasuries. It's already 231 basis points. Like, that's not that exciting. And then if you look at the inflation swap market, here is the 10-year at 219. The 10-year inflation swap always trades at this premium to break evens. And again, it's CPI inflation. It's a linear product. It can go negative and you pay this premium because there's no natural seller of it. So the banks will just mark it up. So you see it's trading today at, you know, A, you're buying this at 230 basis points and B, you're paying, you know, 20 basis point premium just to have, you know, an OTC counterparty risk. Whereas what we own is, is this, um, this is the choose 10 swap curve. And this is, uh, I think, a meta. It's not, it's not a swap. It's an option on this. So right. this is the difference between the two year and the 10 year rate. And you can see back, you know, in 2013, it was just normal, you know, go to a bank, open a CD policy rates were still, you know, under 50 basis points, you lock up your capital for 10 years, it was just normal to have, you know, 250. There was no, nobody was freaking out about inflation here. This was just, you know, we were coming out of the European debt crisis. When we listed the fund, I'll try to put my cursor on it. It was May 14th, 2019. Oh, I think I got it. Okay, so the spot curve was 18 basis points. Today, it's 104. But you can see contextually, it's not like, you know, it's kind of a yawn. Not much has happened yet. And here, I'll just go back to... You guys can still see my screen, right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So the fund is up. I can go to the monthly numbers. Um, about a, a little over 21% since May 14th, 2019, when we listed it. Um, hold on. I don't have today for some reason. What is today? February 5th. <laughs> so 21.8% through today's uh, trading day. And it's just, you know, nothing's really going on. So we're pretty pretty excited about the opportunity because we think, you know, there's a lot of normalization to happen. And that's not even that's not even saying, hey, we're gonna have stagflation or there's gonna be inflation. It's just a more normal environment. And that's so as we Antonio, have Antonio, sorry, that, your question. That, just I just wanna so that reflects the widening that you're talking about that you expect a just going back to normal would create yeah. the widening right that just to put it in the nomenclature that you had talked about earlier yeah go, so go ahead Rod, or just, whoever if you, yeah, so if you I, open a, a bank cd and you lock up your money for a decade it would just be normal to get paid you know if you think the inflation rate is going to be two percent why would you ever lock up your capital and get paid less than that that's what i think is weird that's that's what doesn't make sense to me and when a lot of rate people talk about inflation expectations, they're talking about the break even level, which again, I think it's like saying I own equities and I own the Dow Jones. You know, it's just it's just an index. It's one measure of inflation expectations. The Fed doesn't even use it. So <laughs> I don't think it's super relevant. So one of the things that interests me about uh, options traders, because, you know, you have this long component to the portfolio, but Correct me if I'm wrong. You've you've been trading options since you started your career, and I and mm -hmm. I imagine you were mostly a options trader, understanding the bleed that comes along with holding a position that doesn't do what you want it to do, and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with that? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you do it systematically? Like I'm curious to know once the volatility expanded in March, and you had to re. How do you handle re-upping your position on the options market when it's so expensive? So the nice thing about the fund is it's actively managed because there is no interest rate volatility and inflation head index, so there's nothing to replicate. So you get our expertise for managing, you know, Vega risk in this market, and we can shift at any point whether you know I call myself a Vega monster today because vol's so cheap, I just load up the truck on it. We have, you can see the average tenor of options inside the portfolio is 21 months plus on average. They're very, very long dated options. And that's because I think Vol is a, a back up the truck right now. It's a, it's a really, really cheap, especially with everything that's going on in the you know real life. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in March, 
what we can do is we can use um, more high gamma options, shorter dated options, higher strike options for more convexity. So you have the benefit of, you know, making an asset allocation saying, hey, I want to have a way to, you know, have inflation, have inflation protection. I like having a long volatility product because you know, we're not really correlated to anything else, which is nice. Um, let me just share my screen with you all again. One sec. Uh, this one, such a pain having multiple monitors and doing this. So this is just our fact sheet. And you can see, you know, this is a, the daily correlation of eyeball to many common indices. And you can see we're not, we're not correlated to the VIX. We're not correlated to the ag. We're not correlated to equities. It's just something different. And this is nice because inflation is a risk on trade. And if we go back to the performance that I was showing to Antonia, uh, you can see in uh, in March, Ival, um, we actually don't have the month of March here, but Ival was positive in the month of March, even though tips were down 150 basis points. So we had less of a drawdown than tips by themselves. Um, and then our recovery from peak to trough was four trading days versus tips by themselves took almost three months to get back from peak to trough. So it's a nice thing to own volatility because you get this, you know, it's not correlated to other things. And I, personally, I think that's the reason, like, why why do people have, you know, what's the point of fixed income? What, what's it supposed to do? In my In my opinion, it's supposed to diversify your equity risk. And that could be your private equity beta, your equity market beta, it's its all these portfolios, the risk is in equities. And then the problem is, is we've been in such low rates for such a long time that investors have been pushed away from, from government securities into all sorts of, I like to call it credit crap. That's not the right, very nice word, but they're going into all sorts of things in the search for yield. And then you have like with credit, you have a similar beta to equities, right? Because credit spreads will widen when equities sell off. So I think it's a nice it's a nice product because it gives that enhanced distribution or that potential for enhanced distribution. Let me just show you again. Um, we've been distributing uh, 30 basis points um, monthly. Let me just show you this. Since the fund started paying distributions in that summer. Can you see my screen? Yep. 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 So we actually paid out 50 basis points in December 2019, but 30 basis points a month minimum has been our monthly distribution. And that's nice because investors have been going into all sorts of credit spread product in the, in the search for yield. And Eyeball doesn't have um, corporate credit risk, right? We, we have counterparty risk with the options, but it's different than, you know, some of these products have, you know, all sorts of, you know, European banks and, you know, asset backed securities and CMBS and CLOs and all sorts of, you know, generally credit spread risk. And so I think it's a nice, a nice solution potentially for investors to say, look, I, I want something that's going to diversify my equities. I want to have that monthly distribution and I want to gain exposure to inflation that's not linked to that, you know, that one index. So help me understand and, how a, um, Portfolio of tips. I mean, what's the what's the indicated yield on the on the tips index at the moment? It's got to be in the. Um, that's because tips reset with CPI. Um, so let me go back and uh, share my screen with you all again, and we can bring it up. Um, okay, so we'll go to this is a passive fund that we use uh, the Schwab fund, hmm. and you can see all these omitted, discontinued, blah, 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 because tips reset with the CPI. And CPI uh, over the course of most of 2020 was continuing to fall because of the pandemic and inflation uh, going lower and lower. So there's no guarantee. Tips are a variable yield product. Um, and uh, the, the distribution currently is 1.11% for the 12 month yield from this Schwab fund. We can also look at this one as the it's the same passive index. Uh, this is the, the same Bloomberg Barclays Treasury Index, but you can see also lots of omitted and discontinued because tips are variable. Yeah, so I, I guess where, where I'm going is the, um, so the historical yield has been, call it 
plus or minus a little bit, right? But you're distributing three and a half percent per year. Um, yeah. So, so how do we, how, how do you, how do you close that gap in such a consistent way? Like that's a, that's a, that seems like a huge hurdle to overcome in such a consistent manner. So that's from the options component, obviously. Um, I know, you're, you're buying options, right? So, you're so shorting, you're, you must be shorting trailer, all the right? ball then. What's going on? No, no, we're not selling ball. I'm not selling ball. You guys are, uh, you're, you're, you're equity ball people, right? Because you're, you know, the only way to generate. Totally confused. Help yeah, me totally out. confused. Okay, so equity ball, yeah, there's nothing you can do with equity options. If you own an equity option, you just bleed. It's like every day you walk in, you're going to lose a little bit of money you know, probably 99% of the days. And then maybe one day you'll make a lot, but then it'll mean revert back. And so the reason a lot of people sell, you know, anytime you see the word right, right is like a nice word for short volatility. Um, so put right, buy right, any of that sells equity options. This has nothing to do with equity options. We own interest rate options. But the cool thing about interest rate options is Although you pay time decay because you're still long, long gamma, long vega, long the convexity, but you still pay theta, but we can have positive roll between the spot and the forward. So it's similar more to like, um, you know, FX. A lot of Canadians love to love their carry in the FX market. What is that? That's a rate differential, right? And that's a carry strategy. So I see the rate options market is similar to, you know, other type of carry strategies where we still, you know, we don't sell naked options. We don't sell spreads. There are a lot of tricks that people do in the options world, especially in equities where they, you know, they might say, oh, we're long ball, but they go sell a bunch of front dated options. So they're short gamma um, or they sell, you know, they buy vol in one spot and they sell vol in another. This is very simple. This is a long only fund. It's always, long options, it's just a question of which options were long and how much were long. <laughs> um, and when we right. sell, we sell to close, to profit take, and we roll. And the options are pretty unique because they generate um, ordinary income. Um, let me show you. The Canadians, I'm not sure, I'm not a tax expert. I'm not giving tax advice. I want to do all my, don't know anything about There's no tax. advice here at all. Give the but, disclaimer, uh, Mike. Just, just, just to be clear, there is no advice here of any no kind. Advice, There's also I'm barely any Canadians advice. watching, I suspect. Yeah, yeah. So. But, <laughs> yeah. so you can stick to the American uh, yeah. expertise. Okay, here, about Canada. Not giving advice in America either. I'm uh, yeah, saying, <laughs> precisely. If you, if you go and look at our fact sheet, um, you can see that ah, exactly. options are not ordinary assets. Uh, I'm sorry, they're not capital assets. They're ordinary assets. And so when we sell them for a gain, they generate ordinary income. And that is different than interest income. If you look at our, like, let's see, SEC yield, gosh, it's zero. Why is that? That's because tips, this is through August 21, going back to here, tips didn't pay anything. So there's no interest income. That's why the SEC yield, SEC yield is interest income. The options generate ordinary income not interest income. So that's why this, I think this is kind of weird. I, there's nothing I can do though. It's, it is what right. it is, but they're, um, they're not, uh, they're not regular, you know, most, most funds that use derivatives, whether they're, um, futures, forwards, swaps, all those things are considered capital assets. So they generate capital gains or capital losses. Ours uh, are ordinary, so they generate ordinary income or ordinary losses. And the ordinary losses are not necessarily a bad thing either, um, because say, you know, going back to the house analogy, say you, you know, your house, you, you have homeowners or renters insurance and your house doesn't burn down at the end of the year, you're not like disappointed about that. So say there is no, um, Say, say the options all expire worthless over the course of the year. Say nothing happens. Say there's no interest rate volatility or inflation hedge, and we underperform a regular TIPS portfolio. Let's just say, you know, disaster node. The options that we sell at a loss or options that expire worthless are actually negative income, which is pretty cool because <laughs> there's no you cap on that. Yeah, there's no cap on how much negative income you can have. Um, so the fund is taxed on the fund level, not on the individual level. But again, I'm not giving tax advice. But it's a 
pretty, the rates market is a really nice place to own volatility for the long term because it's not always positive role, but most of the time it does have very, very benign, if not positive carry. So hopefully- To the tune of, to the tune of like two and a half percent a year. What? To the tune of well, like two and a half percent a year, right? So like, some of that's gotta be skill. Be what? Well, yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to close the gap between the 3.6% the annual, um, like monthly distributions, right? Of 30 basis points and the the yield on the underlying tips portfolio. And I know you've actually got a bunch of this cash plus tips, right? So, so you're not, you're not getting, you're not getting the full 1.1% or whatever from the tips. It's like yeah, we whatever have fraction of the tips portfolio. About. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I guess what I'm saying is that that roll yield is um you can be you can be confident enough that that will will be at least call it two and a half percent a year um so, in so order it's not to roll yield it's when we monetize an option so when we sell an option it generates you know if we just hold it mark to market it just has mark to market but if we sell it it generates ordinary income and we are a RIC, right. a registered investment company so we have mm -hmm. to distribute our ordinary income so that's why i say a minimum of 30 basis points because say let's take the say the house does go on fire so there's lots of inflation or stagflation and the options like boom really kick in you know and we lock in profits we'll have a whole bunch of ordinary income which we will be distributing to our shareholders so it's uh it's not a so guarantee that's, that's thing. the uh, variable, right. but the role yield be, helps but but it's the active management that really helps and you're yeah. gonna have to distribute it because you're a wreck Okay, so yeah. it really is all about the uh, the long options um, portfolio that that allow you gotcha. to get that distribution out. So you know you you uh, you kind of call this out for being uh, uh, equity long ball guys, but oh, uh, you know what I mean? that is I don't know, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. It's, it's about always, three or four years ago, people are always the hardest. Jason to Jason person. Buck is on <laughs> here. He's really just livid. I can sense it from his eye, from his emoticon. Um, the you know, I met you three, four years ago in a Toronto hotel, and we were going, we were walking down. Wait, you're telling what? me that you're not that, that way. <laughs> you were telling me that you were, uh, you had this massive Brazil trade on. I can't remember what it was, but I, in my mind, I imagined it was an equity trade, and it was this was an options based trade as well. Uh, so, have you always just focused on the credit market, or are you have you done the whole gamut? And what was that? Tell me about that Brazil trade. I, I, if I recall correctly, it went really well. <laughs> so I only trade options. That's the one thing. You know, I do not like linear anything. I am an asymmetric girl through and through. So no, no linear. You know, besides the, the treasuries, the only thing we have we have treasuries. But I don't like linear derivatives. I no swaps, no futures, no options. So it, I'm sorry, only options. No, no linear derivatives. Um, so I'm sure it was an option trade. Um, and I love, uh, you know, I think of myself as a uh, professional convexity sniffer. And a lot of times when you have, you know, when you have consensus that something is going to happen, usually taking a contrarian view is priced in a really cheap, asymmetric way. So I love to have um, contrarian views. And I think I definitely do remember that specific trade. I probably shouldn't go into details on what that was because that wasn't in the fund that we're managing right now. But my expertise is in options across all asset classes. I don't do stocks. That's someone, I'm not a stock person. So, gotcha. but with equities, we would use countries, indices. Um, and then, so we, we have experience in five asset classes. So rate options, obviously that's what eyeball is. FX options, so foreign currency, all pairs. Um, the uh, credit uh, markets as well. So swaptions and tranches and things like that with convexity and then commodities i love commodity options um and then uh and then equities um but no stocks so it's all five asset classes and that's very similar to what i did at goldman as well it was always cross asset class you know finding uh interesting uh interesting convexities and payoffs and that's why out of all the choices of things to do you know five different asset classes it's a lot of stuff I thought Ival was a really great fund because nobody was worried about inflation or inflation expectations. Nobody owned, you know, that. And I was like, well, that's kind of stupid. Why would people not want to own that? You know, it's like 
nobody wants to outlive their wealth, right? That would be a disaster. So I thought it was a good, you know, kind of, I hadn't done an ETF before launching Eyeball, but I was like, this, this is a good solution for our investors. This is a good problem because tips by themselves are not great. Um, and most fixed income investors are short ball from their mortgages. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I, I just want to be clear that this, I don't necessarily want to focus on, I just don't, I don't want the Vega monster to be the only thing that we're talking about. I want some of the convexity stuff for, to come out. It doesn't need, we don't need to focus on the eyeball ETFs. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really interested in your, uh, all the history as the, all the convexity stuff. So uh, unless there's some reason why you don't want to share the, I, the specific example of Brazil, um, well, just that, generally that speaking, I, I don't have that on now, so I wouldn't feel comfortable talking no. about that, but that's all it, good. I mean, it's, it's, the, the big question with those type of trading, the, the type of trading that you, that you do with options is that it's very different than anything else. Um, it yeah. feels to me like that type of trading leads to a lot of small losses, small losses, small losses and large gains. It just you're not doing linear trades. Does your PL look linear when you're looking at your just com your convexity book or is it more um, choppy and jumpy? Well, I can show you for eyeball because we have a public fund so you can see it um, and it's not that choppy. It's I think it's all about size, right? Size matters. Um, so it's all about how much exposure, how much convexity and it's it's a little bit of an art and a science combined because you want to have you know the right amount of convexity but you don't want something to be like a big swing right a big you know options are a zero or one and so i really like using longer dated options i think most most people in the options world especially in the equity world they love to sell short dated options because they want their theta and they want it now right their goal is to when you sell an option you want it to expire Right? The most you can ever make is the day that you sell it. And so a lot of people sell short dated options because they want that high time decay and they want it now. And so most of the world uh, in the option space, especially in equities, uses shorter dated options. I prefer longer dated options generally in most asset classes because then you have more time for things to play out. Right, You don't have to make a bet about, hey, this is going to happen in a week or next month this is going to happen. Um, so I prefer longer dated options generally. I think a, a quick way to lose a lot of money is in short dated options, if you're long or short, but short's worst. So I, I wanted to, to, to talk about some of the other ways that, that um, inflation might manifest, right? Um, because before, before we go there, Adam, just one, one last small point of clarification, because I, I do love that direction, but it's a, it's a, it's a big turn. So just, so 85% is in tips, some amount of the 15% is managing the duration of tips. And then some percentage of, of that's left over is in the option book. Can, can you on average sort of, um, um, highlight what that is. What what is in the option book on a on a sort of general average over the duration? What what's in what's in the the option book? What percentage of the portfolio? So the nice thing about an ETF is it's fully transparent, so you can always see what it is. Um, and I love that about ETFs. I feel like the transparency is great. Um, so you can pull up like here. We can go into Bloomberg and just pull up the description and you can see that you know about 85% is in the passive treasury fund mm -hmm. and then we have is this adds up to be a little under 6% uh, in fully funded long dated options and you can see the Vega monster in me because look at the tenors of these these are long dated options because I love buying the ball um, mm -hmm. and so we run the portfolio um, and every day you can always see exactly what's in the portfolio so you can see how it changes and how we when we're rolling and what we're doing so typically on average um we've been running the range over the course of the fund's existence has been three percent on the low side in terms of fully funded long options nine percent was the high side that was right after the fund listed in may 2019 um when the fund, it was like a baby fund 
Um, but typically we try to keep it around, but we don't manage, um, we manage a couple of different Greek exposures. Um, so we're doing active management. It's not just the, the, the market value of the options. It's not just a premium, right? It's, it's how, you know, how long dated they are, what strikes do you own? What, what are there? So there are a lot of different components to manage. And that's why we actually have a ton of Canadians who use the fund. Shout out to all my macro Canadian hedge funds, because a lot of them use it because they don't have maybe ISDA agreements on their own, or even if they do, they just don't want the headache of dealing with like, how do I book this? What do I do with it? How do I manage it? They don't want to be managing the Greek exposure on an Excel spreadsheet. You, know, you can't even really price these things in Bloomberg. So we do have a lot of um, professional investors who use our product as a way of gaining access to this market. Did I answer your question well? Absolutely fabulous. Over to Adam. Sorry, Adam, for that uh, interlude. No, 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 no problem. Yep. Um, so yeah, so so an options book on the twos, tens swap market, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, inflation, right? I mean, just just circling the wagon on on this, because I think especially a lot of our audience are, are interested in this. And, and we talk a lot about that on the show. And it's definitely entering the the zeitgeist as as an area of potential concern, right? And so I'm just trying to think about the type of scenario. I, I mean, I think we've covered off the the types of inflation and, and the manifestations of inflation that would um, th that your the eyeball fund is explicitly designed to protect against right i'm wondering if you've got any thoughts on 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 compliments so so for those who are, who are generally concerned about inflation um and who are maybe concerned that inflation might have to leak outside the rates um domain due to you know just general sort of government control um and you know you've played in the multi-asset space for many years. What are your thoughts on how to sort of complement this product with other potential in inflation hedges? So a lot of people use commodities or equities to gain exposure to their, you know, inflation and inflation expectations. And then you have a whole nother segment in the private world that's doing all sorts of like bizarro things like timberland and coffee plantations and illiquid. So I would separate it between two, like the the liquid public securities, which tend to be equities and commodities, uh, and then the private securities, which is, you know, all these, at least in the US, like these public plans have all sorts of like crazy, crazy things that they do, you know, like nut, nuts and coffee and, you know, timber to gain real asset exposure. So I'd say there are two camps. Um, on the liquid side, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, certain equity uh, sectors should do well there. You know, maybe, maybe not. Um, I think the big challenge is if we actually had inflation, then the Fed might not be able to be on hold for as long as they can. And that potentially could make equity sell off. You know, all investing involves risk and there's no, there's no, one trick pony, right? Nobody, you know, we really haven't had it since the 70s. The one thing I do feel confident that we're not going to have 70s style inflation, because personally, I think oil, you know, it's kind of like, a, like a laptop, you know, it's, it's just getting technology is making it cheaper and easier to get out of the ground. I don't really think we're going to have an oil shock like we did in the 70s. But I know a lot of people will buy oil or other commodities as an inflation hedge. And then a lot of people use gold um, or other precious metals. And I get, you know, I get gold from a psychology trade. I get it from a, you know, um, a, F, a currency play. I don't really understand it as an inflation trade. That to me doesn't make a ton of sense because it's a, it's actually a negative carry asset. You know, Warren Buffett, uh, he said uh, in the late 90s, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, if Martians were looking at the earth, they would think we were out of our mind to be digging it up in one hole, melting it down, putting it in a different hole and paying people to guard it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a, you know, and and gold, especially if you have it in, you know, dollars or Canadian dollars, it's a negative carry asset. So I don't know if gold is a good inflation hedge. I definitely think it's good for psychology and it's good for FX, but I think it's more of a 
not an inflation hedge in my point of view, but that's what makes a market. And when people think, you know, a lot of people are buying, you know, cryptocurrencies and other things because they think it's an inflation hedge. It's really not what is not what happens that matters. It's more prices that drive these markets. And I think whatever, you know, I think the rates market is a very pure way of gaining exposure. I'm like, why mess around? Like people are in bank stocks and equity ball and having, you know, tips and all sorts of things. I'm like, isn't it more simple just to use eyeball? I think we'll accomplish that goal in a cleaner way. And then you don't have to be managing all these different things. But like anything, you should diversify, right? Because you just never know, you know, you don't want to have all your chips on one thing. I like that. Um, so, so in a portfolio context then, so considering the different forms that inflation might take and then considering, you know, just the ambiguity about whether we're going to see material inflation in our investment horizon, um, you know, just acknowledging that the huge amount of uncertainty in the trajectory of, of economic um, characteristics and, and financial markets um, and, and sort of scoping out a, a diversified, truly diversified portfolio against all these major types of market conditions. Um, what does a what do you think a portfolio looks like, and where does Ival kind of sit in in that? And how would you kind of think about sizing it? So the one thing I'd say is people. It depends how much you hate credit. <laughs> you know, that's a weird way to start, but I think we all loathe credit. So you're, yeah, you're, loathe you're, it. Yeah, loathe it. Loathe it. It's not <laughs> big. I mean, it's funny because the more people hate credit, the more they're like, oh, I love Ival. Like I have CIOs call me up all the time, and they're like. I have almost 25% of my portfolio. Should I make it bigger? I was like, I don't know. I'm not, you know, sizing is not my thing. I'm like a super specialist, but I think the, the investors who think defaults are going higher, credit spreads are too tight, the rally in equity and credit is just nonsensical, they tend to have Ival as a much bigger piece of their portfolio. Um, some people use it just as an inflation substitute, but it's, I can show you here. Let me share my screen with you. It's a uh, we have in our um, on our eyeball website. There's our materials tab, and in here we have a presentation deck. And on page nine and ten, uh, we have a couple of you know classes of like you know we have we have a whole bunch of model builders who use eyeball. Um, most model builders in fixed income use the Bloomberg Barclays Ag Index. Even if they're active managers, they're benchmarked to the ag. Mm -hmm. The ag is an old index. It used to be the Lehman ag. And it has about 40% as treasuries, but it has no tips in it. Tips were invented by the US Treasury, the inflation protected bonds in the late 90s. And then about a third of it is short vol from mortgages. So we have a bunch of these passive investors who are like, look, we just want we have no idea what's going to happen. We just want to have a diversified fixed income. And they use eyeball as a way to complete that passive fixed income exposure to give inflation, inflation expectations, and to neutralize the short ball of mortgages. Um, so that's been pretty popular as just a, you know, completion portfolio. We do have some, you know, real estate people. I, I think of eyeball as almost like opposite of a mortgage. You know, it, it's, it's long an option in a treasury portfolio instead of an agency obligation and a short option. So some people use it as a, um, you know, potential real estate hedge. It depends. Obviously, real estate's very local. Canada has been a very hot market. I do not know if it would be a good hedge in Canada or not. And then some people use it instead of having minball, lowball equities. I really hate that strategy's name. They tend to be value-based stocks and people see them as defensive because they've had historically less drawdown, but they have really nothing to do with volatility. They just happen to have a lower standard deviation of returns. And so some people use, instead of having like low vol, min vol, they'll use I vol as a way to actually have long vol. And then on the fixed income side, we have a bunch of people that obviously replace it instead of just a tips portfolio. I was wondering about that one. That seems like an obvious use case. Yeah. That's, it's kind of like, especially when you look at, you know, you go back to the level of like, well, wow, break evens are, you know, 231 basis points and this is 104. You know, it's uh, it's pretty obvious there to get, diversify away from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI index. And then some people use it for floating rate notes because 
Floating rate notes are mostly credit spread risk. The coupon resets higher with interest rates, but it's not really the best. If they're worried about higher rates, it may or may not be the best thing. And then short duration has become really popular. Um, we have a lot of people who use, you know, they're in short duration because they're worried about higher interest rates. But the problem, the problem with short duration is short duration is still long duration, right? You are you are a hundred percent guaranteeing that your investors, your clients will lose money in a higher yield environment with short duration. And a lot of the short duration strategies have gone down the rabbit hole into all sorts of credit crap. You know, they have all sorts of, you know, a lot of these indices have, you know, 80% of it is credit exposure. So although it's a short duration credit, you know, think about if you were if you were a company right now, a corporate, and you needed money, would you take a short dated loan? Like I wouldn't. I'd be turning stuff out. You know, give, so me, give me the hundred year. Uh -huh, yeah, it's, it's generally the crappy credits that use short dated debt. In my opinion, that's my bias. I don't want to offend any corporates, but you know, why wouldn't you turn it out? So you look at a lot of these floating rate. You know, it's like short duration, and yeah, it might have a duration less than a year. But the likelihood of that thing, that that Romanian bank going bankrupt, is pretty freaking high. <laughs> so I think it's been pretty popular with a lot of professional fund managers, like a lot of endowments in particular, will use it as a replacement for short duration because at least at least we have the potential to make money in a higher yield environment versus being guaranteed to lose money. And then going back to the the credit thing, the more they don't want credit exposure, the more they look at their short duration managers and they're like, holy cow, it's 85, 86%. And they have all sorts of crazy things in there. You know, a lot of these short duration funds will have CMBS or ABS or, you know, CLOs or um, European banks, all sorts of like, in my opinion, pretty toxic stuff to own in today's environment. So hopefully from, that's- from Advanced cash management, I believe is what they call it. From a, from a multi-asset perspective, though, if your concern is duration, is your bond book even the, the right place to start looking? Or should you be looking at your equity book? I mean, you know, you mean, I, you mean I, you've I, got such a massive duration bet on your, your equity book. Yeah, right. If, if my concern, especially with earnings yields where they are. Yeah, precisely. So so if, if I was if I'm a, an advisor or an allocator that has concerns about duration, there's probably a more effective way to handle the duration in my equity book than there is in my in my bond book potentially. Yeah, I think take that's a good point. And and everybody is worried about interest rates right now. That is a consensus thing, and it's priced fairly, right? You get paid nothing to own short duration. Like you take all this mm. crappy credit spread risk, and you get you know thirty bips a year maybe if you're lucky. Um, so I just I don't see the point. Personally, I'm like, why bother? I'd rather have, you know, eyeball cash and, you know, <laughs> other stuff. Um, so I think short duration has been really popular because um, a lot of investors just don't have a good place to put cash. And because it's a it's a 40 act fund, right? It has it, literally intraday liquidity. And a lot of our institutional investors will trade it at the NAV. This is this is cool. And I know you guys are ETF guys. It's so interesting the nav based technology so i i here's my analogy i am um, i think of trading in the secondary market that's the shares outstanding as like dirty clothes in the laundry right they're go just, they're just going around in the bin they're just trading hands um the primary market is the you can also use for etfs um just like a mutual fund where you trade at the nav etfs have that as well so you can always use the primary market to do it's called a nav base create. Look, it's my business card right here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, my business card. And on the back of it, it has the three magic words, which is called a nav. Uh, I can't get the screen right. Nav base trade. Nav base create is like the new magic words that I learned because some of our institutional investors, when the fund was super small, they'd put like $10 million market order and the thing would go, wow. You know? And there was no reason that it was going up so much. So, a nav based create is the three magic words if you're buying. Nav based redeem is if you're selling, but you can always trade ETFs at the nav. And that's like putting yeah. those into the machine or taking them out. So 
Absolutely. Talk more about that. Talk about the specific process because we agree. We go through this all the time. We run some ETFs and mm -hmm. we see those those hairy bars and we just start. I know. You know, so frustrating. It's like you know, both the relationships are good. It's when you don't control the right. relationship and they're buying at the wrong time, at a yeah, time sure. we're close, whatever. Right. So if you do own it, um, that mechanism so, is so, key. Yeah. So so Nancy, walk through that maybe just hypothetically, not for any fund that any of us manage. <laughs> the the NAB based create process because yeah, I think so, that that's a tremendous value add. So let me let me share screen. So um. All ETFs have a creation uh, size. Um, so let's look at, let's just look for first, we'll look at Spider just because it's a big, big ETF. Um, you can go to the, uh, you know, it's probably on the website or whatever, but you can call your ETF desk and say, what's the creation size? Most ETFs trade in 50,000 shares. That's a kind of typical creation size in the US. What is it in Canada? Um, it's about the same. About the same. So let's see. And and some ETF issuers charge a creation fee, like Spider charges three thousand dollars. I've all I made it small on purpose. I did the smallest we could at the time, which was twenty five thousand shares, because I want it to be efficient. I want it to be like a good thing for clients. And then we waived um, the creation fee, so it's zero. So this is about it's twenty five thousand shares times the NAV of the fund is one creation unit. And so let's see. Let's put in you guys H R A A C N, right? So all, yours has twenty five thousand too, and yes, also great for investors. No creation fee. I was hoping that was the case. <laughs> so very both both your ETF and my ETF are very efficient. And here I'll show you on our. Um, let me go to our presentation deck. There, this is not specific to Eyeball, but if you go to the back of our presentation deck, it is page. Uh, which one? This one, page 17. It has a little slide here, not specific to our fund. All ETFs work this way, describing primary market versus secondary market. Secondary market is the share is outstanding. It is the clothes in the laundry machine. They just trade hands. Primary market is adding laundry or taking it out of the bin. And you can use that with the APs. Um, our fund, we have 17 different APs, and you can even do it with your custodian. You just call up and say, I'd like a NAB base create, or you can ask for a block trade. And then you can compare to see which is better for your investors to use. But I think it's awesome that you guys have no no fee because it just makes it more efficient. And I think it's also good when you have um, dislocations in the market. Like, for instance, March. March was a mess in the U.S. Treasury market. The Treasury market got completely whack, and that's my technical term for it. <laughs> you know, it broke. Um, so liquidity can go away in any market at any point. And if, say, you owned um, any Treasury ETF, Ival, anything, and you wanted to sell and the fund was trading at a discount to NAV, you can obviously sell using a NAV-based redeem. So it's just a, a good thing for you know ETF investors to know as fiduciaries, they can always decide which is the better way to execute primary or secondary. And it sometimes depends whether you're buying or selling, which is better. So the, your counterparty on the um, on the options book, are they they'll, they're willing to create and redeem intraday, give you um, or give the APs quotes on the underlying so you can you can stay at nav there you didn't have any trouble in march with with pricing those um or well, the, creates the and redeems fund that we use had a lot of problems it was trading at a substantial discount to nav for yeah like right month. um pretty much every treasury etf dislocated because the treasury market broke and so etfs the liquidity of etfs is only what is the underlying so etfs are often blamed for liquidity events but etfs are the only thing that trade the reason that people were using etfs to trade treasuries is they couldn't trade treasuries directly in the market because it was broken so most pretty much all treasury etfs were trading at a discount to nav and that's just because the etf was the only thing that was actually had liquidity so yeah, I, I remember andrew miller pointing out in in i think it was march 19th or something that the, mm -hmm. the tlt was trading at a seven percent discount to nav <laughs> it was yeah. just, that is that was just really Bonkers. that was a scary yeah. now were you able to, to as you price eyeball were you able to price it based on the underlying 
nav of the uh, Schwab, or we, did you have to use the mark to market um, of the of the ETF? Well, I don't know if it's an ETF, the Schwab product. Yeah, so, so ETFs always have two prices. There's the nav, and then there's the secondary market. So yeah. it's always the same. And I have nothing to do with pricing. I don't price. You know, the administrator prices the book. It's not the portfolio manager who does that. So I'm sure the same with your ETF. So I have nothing to do with pricing. It's independently priced, which is a, a good thing for our investors. Yeah, I was just, I was wondering whether the options can be, the APs have access to um, to, to pricing and like, you know, they can go to the to the dealer and, and add exposure to those options intraday to facilitate creates or, or, or redeem exposure in those underlying options to facilitate redeems. Um, and it sounds like they can, which is really neat. Well, they, they do um, for the options piece, they deliver the uh, the treasury ETF in kind. So they deliver shares of the Schwab ETF and then they deliver cash in lieu for the options. So it's actually incredibly efficient because our fund is a $14 billion treasury fund and then the AP delivers cash. And so we always change the basket every night because it's actively managed and distribute that to all the ET, all the ETF participants. But it's a pretty efficient fund because um, the Create Redeem, I remember when the fund was like a baby fund, it was like, uh, I don't know, $20 million. And we had an Australian investor interested and they're huge. You know, the Australians love cheap fees and long convexity where I'm like, I'm their girl. Right. <laughs> and the Canadians. But um, we had a Canadian fund that was like, how much liquidity can we get? And I was asking different APs, to, you know, to give us markets. And they were making, you know, 250 million NAB based trade markets and eyeball when the, the whole fund was 20 million. But that's because the underlying is a 14 and a half billion dollar treasury fund in cash and loose. So it makes it super efficient in terms of the create redeem process. Yeah, it's an implicit versus explicit liquidity type scenario that I think yeah. that's why I wanted to go into the creates because it's it is, uh, you know, just because when when you were in that in that um, gestation period and there wasn't a lot of um, mm -hmm. liquidity on the markets, the markets that you're trading have, you know, not infinite liquidity, but certainly massively significant liquidity. And, and thus, um, these are things that that are, are probably not well known generally. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the one I do have one other question coming to like, so on the convex book, on the options book, when you have a daily priced product, right? One of the things that that uh, I think that we've always um, known as, a, as, a, as something that's hard is, is, OK, so you get a convex payoff and then you have to think about money coming in and out on a daily basis and how to sort of manage the tail wagging the dog. And I don't, I don't know if you can delve into that at all. Is it, is it proprietary or is it part of the sort of the, the gamma and big exposure that you're managing on hold in the options book that you think about that? How do you, how do you manage that? So I operate as a fiduciary for the fund and I always do what is right for the fund as a fiduciary in my discretion as the portfolio manager. So daily flows in or out of the fund, you know, the nice thing is it's not an index fund, right? We're not trying, an index fund is trying to replicate an index and not have tracking error, right? So right. Fund, price insensitive. Yeah, the, the fund portfolio manager is, is judged entirely on, do you have tracking error? And if so, how much? I do not have that problem. I operate as a fiduciary for the fund. I don't have to do anything ever unless I hit my risk limits. That The only time I ever have to trade is if the fund was, you know, we had 20% option premium, I would have to take it down. But I don't ever, unless I'm hitting a risk limit, I don't need to ever do anything that's not in the shareholder's interest. And that's a nice thing for our investors, because, you know, if you have, um, there are a lot of equity vol strategies that are passive. And that's fine if you're selling options, because you have to have, you know, you want them to expire, you want them to go away. But if you're long options, if you have something move, intra-month you don't want to have to wait till the end of the month and hope that thing is still down like a a good example would be february 2018 right that was when the fed changed the ccar uh calculation and the u.s and canadian equity markets dropped like a rock on friday and monday but if you only rolled at the end of the month with a passive 
fund, you were screwed because it all came back. It was just that like little bit of environment. So if you're going to own, you know, if you have gamma, if you're long vol and you're long convexity, I think it would be foolish to ever have a passive fund, in my opinion. Did I get your question good? Yeah, no, of course. So, so, so it's about judgment. It's, it's about, you know, you are acting in the best interest of, of the shareholders. And, you know, if you get a, a massive payoff, you're going to have to think about that and your risk limits and make decisions within the context of that. I'm summarizing, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's the expertise and judgment that are pe people are paying for when they, when they buy eyeball or, or invest in any of the other quadratic mandates that, um, that you're operating in. We would second that motion. Yes, we like that. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else that you gents haven't covered for Nancy? No, <laughs> no I appreciate Very the time. And, yeah. is, Nancy, is there anything else we haven't covered? What are yeah, the top right. questions that everybody else asked that we, we have uh, you know not stumbled across? Hey, you guys have been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. I mean, not what I normally do on a Friday evening, so... Uh, Pleasure to join you all, and you know, I hope you guys uh, stay safe and uh, keep keep cracking. I'll watch your ETF; it looks awesome, and uh, you know, really appreciate the time to be on your show. And if anyone has questions about the fund, you can always go to our website. It's Ival ETF. You can email us, ask questions, and we're you know, nice thing about ETFs is it's so it's full fully transparent. Like I love the product because it's just it's such a great you know. And I think the, the one thing I would say is allocators need to really embrace the ETF technology because it's it's a commingled fund, right? And having, I guess, my, my big thing is I don't think it makes sense if you have public securities, why would you stick them in a private fund wrapper? You know, the only reason people do that is because it's a manager compensation scheme because you can lock up their AUM and charge more. And so I think public securities being in a public fund wrapper just makes so much more sense. So I'm uh, fighting the fight. I think ETFs are awesome. They're great technology for investors. And I hope, you know, hopefully you get some of the Canadian pensions to embrace it because they're all allocators and they're all allocating to these like, you know, blah, 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 esoteric hedge funds that don't have liquidity. And when you're trading liquid public markets, why not have the liquidity and the transparency and the lower fees? So there you go. Love it. Amen. Right. <laughs> well, th thank you for your time. And I will, I will remind everybody because I thought this particular show was absolutely spellbinding. And uh, so I will remind everyone to like and share, uh, resolve riffs, <clears throat> propagate the message so that we can continue to have great guests like Nancy on and continue to share, um, you know, I think thoughtful and novel and unique angles and views on the ETF market, the futures market, portfolio management, optimizations, and et cetera. So smash the like button, share, and, and give, uh, give Resolve and I have all some love. Exactly. All right. Thanks, all guys. Right. Have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks so much. All. Really a pleasure being your guest. Thank you. Bye. Today's podcast is brought to you by Horizons Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation ETF, which trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol HRAA and is sub-advised by Resolve Asset Management. HRAA is an alternative fund whose investment objective is to seek long-term capital appreciation by investing directly or indirectly in major global asset classes, including, but not limited to, equity indices, fixed income indices, interest rates, commodities, and currencies. HRAA gains exposure to these asset classes by investing in derivative instruments that may include future contracts and forward agreements and securities. HRAA will take long or short positions using up to a maximum of three times leverage in asset classes such as equity indices and fixed income asset classes, commodities, currencies, volatility indices, and other alternative asset classes. To learn more about this, please visit www.horizonsetfs.com slash HRAA to read about the ETF's investment objectives and important disclaimers about the risks associated with an investment in the ETF.